Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? Um, I applied, I don't remember the exact date, but it was during when I, when I was a, in the wildlife fire team, I, I applied and um, I don't, I'm not good with dates, so I don't remember the day I got hired, but I remember coming to the academy in 2011. Okay, and were you already hired at the SO when you went to the academy? Yes, I was. Uh, but is, are there certain re uh, requirements that you complete the academy before you become a deputy or a certified peace officer? Right, you have to complete the academy to be a certified peace officer. Now, which academy did you attend? I was academy there in Santa Fe. I can't remember the DPS um, law enforcement academy. I don't remember. Is the department is it the Department of Public Safety law enforcement academy? Yeah, yeah, in Santa Fe. All right. And in your academy class, were there just sheriff's deputies, or was it a mix of of, of other law enforcement agencies? It was a mix of, of other law enforcement agencies um, throughout Mexico. Okay. And uh, how did you like your academy training? I really liked it. I like I like the academy. What did you like about it? Um, I, I really like learning new things, and um, everything we were doing in the academy was really exciting to me. The driving and and the, and the defensive tactics and everything. I I really enjoyed. It. Did, did you successfully graduate from the academy? Yes, I did. Okay. And when you were at the academy, did you have training in the use of firearms, say, for instance? Yes. Did you train with uh, pistols or rifles or shotguns? I mean, the academy, it was all strictly with uh, your side arm with a pistol. Okay. And let's talk for a moment about that pistol training. If you'll tell the jury, um, what did you have to learn um, at the academy in order to pass? What, what skills did you have to become proficient with with fire? You have to learn all the safety rules of firearms. You have to learn everything, how to clean your firearm, how to dismount your firearm. Um, you're certain when you can use your firearm. And, and then we had a lot of time at the range where we um, we, would, we would practice shooting. I mean, you had to meet a certain standard and a certain accuracy to, to pass the firearms block. And and in the academy, did you become proficient with uh, with a handgun? Yes, it was, uh, it was very repetitive. And, really drilled it into how to, how to get proficient at your firearm. Were there, were there certain tests you had to take um, to, um, to, to, to test whether you were qualified, uh, whether, whether you were a sufficient uh, a marksman? Yes, you had to, you had to do a night, night qualification fire, and then you had to do a day qualification. And did you have to make a certain, uh, did you have to hit a certain amount of targets or get a certain percentage to be considered a pass? Yes, there was, um, it was kind of like a course where the day you shoot from different ranges at the target, and um, you have to have a certain percent of accuracy to, um, to pass, the, pass the test. And would, would uh, proficiency in marksmanship be one of the requirements um, that you, you make to have a certain proficiency in order to graduate from the academy? Yes. Right. Now, was, uh, was physical strength or physical conditioning, um, was that also a component of the academy? Yeah, in the academy, they, we were doing a lot of physical fitness. I'm um, running, push up, sit up, constantly. Um, yeah. Did you have to be able to run a certain amount of time, distance in a certain amount of time? And yes, you had to um, mile and a half in a certain amount of time, and then you had to do a certain amount of push up, sit ups in a, in a minute. So it's a lot of uh, testing on your physical side. Were, were, you, you, were, you ever, um, were you ever disqualified because of either your ability as a marksman or your ability as a, uh, uh, your physical strength? I know it wasn't. Okay. Now, at the academy, did um, did you have any blocks? Are they called blocks? Is that the right? Yeah, they called blocks. Yeah. Did you have any coursework or any blocks of study on self defense? Yes, we had a whole block on self defense. And tell the jury what you mean by a block of self defense. Well, it was like a certain amount of time. I think it was either two or three weeks set aside for each block. So that whole long um, block, you just woke up every day, and that was all you were doing. Was learning you know, self defense, and when when you're learning self defense, did you learn um, certain tactics um, to to keep you safe? Yeah, I mean the whole block of self defense was. I mean, they really harped on your safety, and um, you're going to go home at night, and you do everything you can to protect yourself, so you can go home to your family. And um, we learned a lot of different moves to. Um, you know, take away knives, take away guns, okay. what do you do in certain situations. Okay. So for instance, did you ever learn if someone's coming at you with a knife, how to disarm that person with a knife? Yes, we learned how to disarm someone with a knife is you're in a bad situation if you have to disarm someone with a knife. Okay. 
but it involves what what is involved what is it how does how what is involved with disarming someone with a knife? Oh um, well with a knife you're trained to if you have a gun and they have a knife you and they're coming up to a knife you shoot you have to shoot. But if it gets to that point where you don't have a gun and they're coming up to a knife, we had to learn some moves to, to take away a knife. Okay. Did you ever um, at any point learn to disarm someone who had a gun when you didn't have a gun? Yes. Okay. Tell the jury, if you will, why that was important, and tell them what you learned and why that was important. Well, it was important because um, when, when you're a police officer, every scene you go into, there's a gun. It's your gun. So we were learning to different moves to keep the gun in the holster. If someone's trying to get out of your holster, and we've also learned moves that if someone got your gun, how to remove it from that person. And it was from every angle, um, behind you, in front of you, and we would go over and over and over and over again. Is this something that you spent a couple of hours on, or is it something that maybe you spent more time on at the academy? It was a long time. I don't really not remember how long, but it was at every angle, over and over again. Do you ever remember being taught that this is something you had to know and had to do and had to not think about? Yeah, it became second nature and, and without thinking you expected to do it. Uh, was it ever drilled into you that if you don't know how to do these things, it's going to get you killed? Oh, yeah. yeah Explain. Any time a gun is pointed at you, you're in a terrible, that's the worst situation you can be in. And um, are you taught, or were you taught at the academy to be um, hypervigilant? Were you taught to, what were you taught about hypervigilance and being aware of your surroundings? Well, we were taught um, to always look at people's hands, and, and you're taught that people's hands will kill you, and the academy really harped on, you know, being very vigilant and, and seeing everything, and always being super, um, Just observative, I guess. Okay. And that applied to uh, observing about your handgun as well as other people's hands and, and, and potential weapons? Right, right. Okay. All right, so you were sitting here when Captain Gonzalez demonstrated the, uh, the way to disarm someone with a gun? Yes. Uh, does Captain Gonzalez know what he's talking about when he demonstrates how you take a gun away from somebody? Uh, yes, he does. Yeah. And is that what you were taught? Yeah, we were taught to. First thing is that you, you got to get the, the barrel away from you. And um, and once you do that, you you turn the gun hard down to kind of break the thumb. It's like turning down towards them and then breaking, rolling over the thumb so it breaks the grip of the gun. And do you use your? Do you, are you able? Are you taught to use your momentum to to, to pry the gun out of somebody's hand? Yes, yeah, so you're taught to to really use force and right to really use your body weight. And the demonstration that Captain Gonzalez gave us is that's what you, is that what you were taught at the academy? Yep. Is it fair to say that at the academy and all of these trainings that you were taught to do, not think that this was something that just had to happen in a millisecond? Yeah, it was, it was very um, it's driven in your mind that. These things are, um, they can kill you. So you need to be able to act when you're presented with a certain threat. Otherwise, you may not know home. Okay. Now, did you successfully complete the academy? Did you graduate? Yes, I did. Okay. And what happened after you graduated the academy? After I graduated the academy, I went straight to patrol on um, day shift with, my, with the San Jose Sheriff's Office. And was there a, uh, a probationary period where uh, there was a determination made if you were right, the right fit for the department? Yes, I think, it was, it was, I think it's a year, a year probation. Now, prior to going to, to the academy, you were actually on patrol, but you would have been in a training, a trainee. Yes, mine was a little different. In the, um, I went to, I went through field training. It was three months of field training before I actually went to the academy, because the academy started at a certain time, and I was already hired on the department, so they decided, well, we'll just put you through field training. And then by the time I went into the academy, I had already completed that. So once I got out of the academy, I just started on patrol right away. Did, did that have anything to do with special treatment or more of the timing of the academy? No, it, it was just more timing of the academy. And, and when, you, when you were a field trainee, what does that entail? Um, there's different phases. 
um, first phase, I think you're, you're pretty much riding along with another officer and they're kind of showing you the ropes and, and what to do and how things are run. And then the second phase, you're starting to kind of help with all the all what's, what's going on and they're kind of walking you along. And then the third phase, you're pretty much doing everything and they're just kind of observing you and telling you, you know, what you did wrong or, and they're critiquing you throughout the process. Is there any kind of special certification you receive or commission you received after you have finished the academy and after you've finished your field training? Yeah, I mean, you receive a, you sort of receive a certificate after the academy and then I don't know about after field training. Well do you ever do you ever achieve a certain status, say you're a commissioned officer? Yes. And what does that mean in your mind if you'll tell the jury? That you're just um, you're able to perform your duties as a, as a peace officer in this and you're commissioned by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department um, as an employee and as a deputy. Yes. Okay. Now, after you finished the academy and started as a, as a deputy, did your training in there? Uh, no. All right. Did you have um, additional trainings throughout the course of your employment? Yes, I did. And did you have trainings in self-defense? Um, I had a few special um, classes with self-defense through other um, consulting agencies. I would come and put on trainings. And what kind of what are the kind of what are the kinds of training did you receive through these special consulting agencies? Um, a lot of it was um, tactics. I, did, I went to a basic SWAT training, and I went to other. I think the companies TAC one. They um, put on um, self defense training where I, I was um, involved with. I think there was a jiu jitsu, and then I did some um, night training. Okay, and we'll get to your SWAT training in just a second. But the, um, uh, when, you, when, you, when you became employed with the Sheriff's Department, did you have any specialized training on either shotguns or long guns? Oh, yes. In the, in the department, they trained you on uh, the AR-15 and uh, a shotgun. And then you had additional training for some like, uh, automatic submachine guns and such, right? Yes. Okay. And that was part of your SWAT training? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, as far as your handgun, as far as your sidearm is concerned, um, the, what role uh, as far as either um, enforcing the law or protecting yourself, does that, does that sidearm, does that, that, does that pistol, um, what, what significance does that play in your role as a law enforcement officer? Uh, a big role, it's like a part of you, it's like an extension of, of your body. Okay. And you're trained when you use it and when you can use it and when you can't. Okay. Now, as part of that training on when you can use a gun and when you can't, are you familiar with um, with what's been uh, identified as the use of force model? Yes, yes, very much so. And describe for the jury what that use of force model is, if you can, to the best of your ability. The use of force model is a model that kind of gives guidelines on, on how a police officer should react to a certain action of somebody else. So it has like different colors, and if someone's like acting this way, you can act a step above to calm that person down or a de-escalate the situation. For instance, is it a, does it give examples of actions and then, then prescribe reactions? Right, right. Like, for instance, if someone is across the street yelling at you, are you allowed to draw your fire? No. If someone's across the street screaming profanities, can you draw your baton and strike them? No. All right, so, so that would be in the extreme, right? Right. That's, that's and then uh, if you give the example to the jury, um, what's some uh, examples of when you are able to use non-lethal force and then when you're allowed to use lethal force under these guidelines that you've been trained? Well, it's very situational based, but um, non-lethal force is, you can use non-lethal force when you're presented with a non-lethal force that's coming at you. So if someone's kind of just, a, if someone's beating you up, you can't just draw your firearm or try to kill it. Um, if someone's beating you up, there are other, there are other forms of, of non-lethal force that you can employ, right? Right. Now, the, the use of force model, though, allows you um, to, to protect yourself, right? Right. So, for instance, if someone's beating you up, that might not allow you to employ lethal force, but if someone's going for your gun, what does that do for you? Oh, if someone's going for your gun, it's, it's lethal force because you don't know what's going to happen if they get your gun. Okay. Now, one of the things you're trained at the academy is to look out for potential threats, right? Right. And whether or not someone is armed uh, or can be potentially armed is certainly something you're looking out for, correct? 
Correct. And would you agree that you would be hypervigilant about whether someone else was armed, whether with a knife or a gun or a baseball bat or a tire iron or whatever it might be, right? Right. It's drilled into us that you always watch people's hands and what they have in their hands. And are you taught that not just firearms are deadly force, but also anything that can kill you is a deadly weapon, right? Yes, yes. So if someone has this pin in their hand and you think they might stab you in the throat, that's a deadly weapon, right? Right. They're attacking you with pins, stabbing you. Definitely. So when we talk about deadly force, and I think this is the way you've been trained, anything that can be used to kill you is a deadly weapon, right? To kill you or cause great bodily injury. Kill or hurt? Yeah, hurt very bad. Okay. And does this use of force model allow you to use uh, deadly force to protect not only yourself, or does it is it apply to other people as well? Yes, to protect yourself and it's the safety of others. And, and you heard Captain Gonzalez talk about this idea of assess, cover, assess. What's that mean to you? Um, you, you assess and you, you, you have to see what action you take, and then you assess again. And um, the, this idea of assess, cover, assess, does that have any application to, um, to, to you making a decision on when to terminate a threat? Yes, it does. Okay, tell the jury, if you will, what that term terminate or stop a threat means. Well, we're trained to, um, to stop the action that's going to kill you. So we're trained to, you know, use lethal force until that action is stopped. And that action being stopped, that's, that, that relies to a certain degree on decision making on your part, right? Yes, it does. And so when Captain Gonzalez talked about assess, cover, and then assess, assess, what, what, what does that first assess mean? Well, it's pretty much using the use of force model, I mean, what you can do, and then taking action, and then assessing again. And then taking action. So when we talk about cover, that's not diving for cover or diving behind a door. Cover is managing that threat, right? Right. I mean, if, if you need to take cover, then that's definitely an option. But, but you can take cover or assess and take action or whatever you need to do to stay alive. And then the, the, then the assess is the third part. After you, are, after you know the threat's gone or after the threat's been terminated, then you what? Then you stop the action. And which that's reassess, right? Right. Reassess. And again, with this use of force training, is this something that you spent a few hours on, or, or did this permeate the totality of your training? No, this was constantly it was like drilled into you, use of force model. And was it drilled into you just at the academy, or was it drilled into you after you became an officer? It was drilled into you after your officer, doing other trainings. And was it drilled into you just during your first week on the force, or after you became a patrolman, after you became a deputy? Is no, this some, it's, it's a constant. Is this something that, that is constantly evolving and you're constantly learning? I mean, there's different scenarios within the model, but you're always assessing different situations, but you're always using the use of our model. At any point in time after you became a deputy and after you started day shift, were you, um, were you asked to put in for the SWAT team? Uh, yes, I was. And how, how, does, um, how, does, how does one go about as a deputy um, becoming part of a, a more of a specialized team? Well, I, my probation, probationary period ended, I think it was like a, it was a year, and um, the SWAT team leader approached me and said, hey, you should apply for SWAT. Give you the SWAT. And the SWAT team leader was who? Uh, Nathan Segura. And so he was Nathan Segura, he was, uh, was he a lieutenant then? Uh, he, oh, then I think he was just a deputy. Okay. He but said, he was the team leader of the, of the SWAT team. Okay. And you put in for SWAT, and, and there was some testing required? Yes, you had to do um, a physical fitness test, to, um, and you had to pass that to even be selected. Were there, uh, were, was, there was there any other component of the application, uh, like an oral exam or, or a written test, anything like that? I think they asked you some questions, and they, you had to um, have uh, no use of force issues within the department, and, uh, but the physical fitness part was a large portion. And you were uh, accepted for SWAT? 
It's only accepted. And of what training, if any, additional training did you receive as, as, a, as a member of the SWAT team? Our SWAT team training really consists of um, building entries, how to recognize threats, um, how to clear buildings and do different scenarios in order to um, disescalate a situation as a team. And did this uh, involve assessing deadly situations? Oh, yes. In a variety of different circumstances? You know, yeah, we had you know, hostage situations, um, clearing um, big buildings, clearing small buildings, um, armed shooter, active shooter. So a lot of different scenarios that we could go over and train. And after you were accepted on the SWAT team, uh, in relationship to the other officers on the SWAT team, were you the oldest, the youngest, somewhere in the middle? I uh, was the youngest. And were you ever deployed with the SWAT team? Deployed for the situation? Yeah. Oh, yes, we got it. Okay. Now, after, um, after you were a patrolman for a while, I mean, uh, well, you were on patrol as a deputy, right. you, um, you were assigned to a, a different job, right? Right. I, um, I applied to test for um, agents. So there's two agents in our department, and their job is to, um, to serve, serve warrants. The rest of the and did you have a, uh, a specific partner that you were teamed with on a daily basis? Yes, I did. You're always good. And who was that? Ronaldo Yuri. And um, during your um, your time as a, as a warrants agent, what did you typically do? Where, what, what was a, what was your job? Our job was to um, apprehend and search for people who had outstanding warrants, and we would focus on um, felony warrants. So we would team up with different agencies within Santa Fe, like probation or the city of Santa Fe or state police, and get together and form a team to to serve high risk felony warrants. Situation? Did you encounter situations where people were armed? Yes, on occasion. Did you encounter situations with uh, with, with armed felons, uh, people running from the law? Yes, I was. It was a very high stress. Job. I've been in many foot chases and um, intense, I guess you can say, situations. Okay. Now let's talk for a moment about Mr. Martin, Jeremy Martin. Were you in the same academy class with, with Jeremy Martin? Uh, no, I wasn't. Did you know him socially? No. How did you know Mr. Martin? I just knew him at work, you know, just high and by him. I never really worked with him. And in October of 2014, you, were you assigned by Captain Gonzalez to do a transport? Yes, it was. Okay. And who originally was going to be on that transport team? Originally it was Steve Moore. We, well, we were assigned to, to pick up this person from Arizona to bring him to Santa Fe in order to answer for some charges he had in Santa Fe. And then we were assigned to bring him back to Arizona once that was over. And um, was, this, was the transport from Arizona to Santa Fe successful? Did you get? The yes, the transport from Arizona was successful. Me and Steve Moore went and we flew to, I believe, Tucson. And then we drove to Stafford, which was another like four hours. And then we had to pick it up and drive back and then go back on the airplane, which was kind of a hassle. So I, we decided next time we'll just drive because it'll be a lot easier. And so the decision was made, and the time came to take uh, this prisoner back to Arizona, right? Yeah, that's right. And where is Safford, Arizona? Well, it's, I don't want to kind of say exactly where it is, but it's not too far. How many hours is it from Las Cruces? I think it's like two, two and a half hours. Okay. Somewhere in southern Arizona, right? Yes. And at, at, at any point in time prior to this transport, did, um, did your regular partner, Steve Orr, um, did something happen where you couldn't go with you? Yes, I, I was um, doing SWAT training Friday, and um, he called me when I was finishing and said he couldn't go on the transport because he was feeling pretty good at the hospital for, for some reason. And, and was another individual assigned to go on the transport with you? Uh, yes, Jeremy was. And had you and Jeremy ever gone on a transport together? No, no, we haven't. Had you ever been partnered together in any way prior to this transport of, of this prisoner back to Arizona in October, October 27, 2014? No.
had you ever uh, spent more than uh, a few minutes together uh, professionally prior to October 2014? No, I would have just seen in the office in Ohio and Moscow and that, that's pretty much it. Prior to, prior to this pairing and this transport, had you ever been assigned together in any capacity through your work? No. So let's talk about the transport for a moment. Um, the, the, the unit that's been depicted in, in some of these photographs, whose unit is that? That's my police unit. That's your police unit. And the photographs of your police unit, um, what, when you look at those, what did, those, what did they depict? Like the back of my unit? Yes. Uh, that's all my gear, all the stuff I had to have for SWAT, and um, a lot of the stuff I had to the job. And was there anything uh, depicted in those photographs that was extra or that you put in there or that, that wasn't required for your job? No, I had a lot of, some of the stuff, there was a lunchbox with my lunch in it. I, I'm more speaking of the, the rifles. Was the, uh, was the shotgun in there? Was that a, uh, a department issue shotgun? Oh, yes, that's a department issue. Like that's just like a regular 870 pump, right? Yes, the shotgun was a uh, Remington. Remington, all right. And then there was a, I believe there was a, uh, an assault rifle or a long rifle depicted. Yes, I had a rifle that was, um, I was assigned to for, for the SWAT team. And then there were uh, multiple boxes of ammunition. Was, uh, was that ammunition department issue? Uh, yes, that was on the department. Now, did you have any other handguns in that vehicle? No, there was no other handguns in the vehicle. How many handguns did you have when you left Santa Fe to go on this transport? I had one. And that's your Glock? Yes, sir. And that's the department issue Glock, right? Yes, sir. Now, that Glock's a little bit different. It has a flashlight attachment, right? Yeah, I attached a flashlight that I, I purchased on my own. And that is the gun. And why would it be necessary for you to have a flashlight attached to your gun? Well, I was serving a lot of warrants, and I had my gun out a lot of, a lot of the time. We did a lot of building clearing, and um, it was so much easier than having a flashlight. Like this, where you can use your hand. So I, I needed this hand to either, you know, move stuff out of the way, or you know, grab somebody. So I had my flashlight on my hand, on my gun, I mean, to to operate with one hand, and then I used this hand to do other things. And that was that department certified. That was something that was okay with your bosses, right? Yeah. And is it safe to say, or is it fair to say that that anything, any weapons you had, had to be approved by someone else up the chain of command? Right. You can't just pick something crazy and carry it. Uh, it has to be department approved. All right. The um, all was all of the ammunition in the vehicle um, applicable to one of those weapons. Yeah. I think so. All right. So in the transport itself, when when you um, did this transport, what time did you get 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 on the road? That morning? It was uh, very early in the morning. When are you going to early start? I don't remember exactly what time. And what's the first thing you do? Um, we decided to meet each other at the office, so I, uh, I drove to the office that morning. And um, I, I was, the dispatch gave me a call and I, I returned a warrant that they needed um, that was related to a double homicide that happened that weekend. So the dispatch wanted to return a warrant, so I did that and Jeremy was at the office too. Proceeded to the jail to pick up William. And it's convenient because the jail's right across the street from the sheriff's department, right? Yes, it's right across the street. And so you picked up Mr. Uh, the prisoner and, um, and, and off you go, right? Sorry. That's okay. You picked up the prisoner at the, at the Santa Fe County Detention Center and you headed south, right? <clears throat> yes, that's right. And what tie, uh, what was the mood in the vehicle? Um, when, when you were when you were um, doing the transport during the during the morning hours, it was fine. Um, I didn't really know Jeremy, so we were kind of getting to know each other. Um, we stopped at Burger King on the way, and I think we were in Rio Rancho and I bought everybody breakfast, including the morning of my transport. And um, were you ultimately successful in? in Dropping Mr. Well, the prisoner off at um, at the jail in Sanford. Yes, yes, it was successful. And it was actually the Department of Corrections. That's a DOC facility out there, right? Right. Okay. 
And what was was there anything unusual or did, uh, anything happen during the transport um, that caused you any concern? No, there was a much. We stopped at a gas station. And Jerry made a joke about said, if you run, I'm gonna shoot you. He told that to William. But he was just joking. Yeah, it was a joke. Yeah. Okay. And so that was it. Yeah, it was time. It was off, but it's a joke. All right. Then at what point in time, or about what time in the afternoon did you um, did, did you drop off Mr. Chapman or, or the, the transportee um, at the DOC facility out in Arizona? I don't recall the exact time, but I want to say it was around noon, noonish. And what decision did you make uh, about coming to Las Cruces? Well, we decided that there was nothing to do in Sanford, and Las Cruces was only a couple, a couple hours away, and then there was more to do here in Las Cruces. And then I knew um, that after, or I mean, that next morning, I knew they would be a shorter drive to Santa Fe from Las Cruces than from Safford to Las Cruces. Now, what night of the week was this? Uh, it was on Monday. And so Monday's in October. Something happens on Monday night, right? Yeah, football. And are you a Cowboys fan? I say it. And did, uh, were plans ever made to, to watch ball? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to watch them. So, how did you end up uh, making plans to stay at the Encanto? Well, I kind of knew Las Cruces, so it was my idea to get a room at the Encanto because it was close to um, different bars, like Hooters, Farley's, um, that we didn't have to drive. Right? And you knew, did you wear, or you, do you know that uh, of strict prohibitions about drinking and driving in your Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to drink and drive. And, and both you and Mr. Barton were particularly sensitive to the fact that you didn't want to ever have to get in that car drinking, right? Right. right. Okay. So about what time did you, well, did you, were you able to make reservations over the telephone, or how did you make the reservations? Well, we got there, and we asked the tenant room, and he said no rooms were available. So then we looked on you know, those websites, like the applications that you can, hotels.com or some application, and they had rooms on there. So we asked them, well, there's rooms available here. And he said, yeah, if you purchase through them, then we can and you were able to do so. Yes. And um, a, a room was secured, and uh, and you, you checked in, right? Yes. Okay. So what happened after you checked in? Did, uh, about what time? Do you recall? I don't remember what time. It was around uh, maybe two, three after. However long it took to get from jail to uh, Massachusetts. Was it dark outside? No. Uh, had the ball game started yet? I don't believe so. Now. now, with your with your weapons, do you generally, um, as far as department policy, what what do off duty officers what's what are you supposed to do with your handguns? Well, it's, there's no really policy. It's just you know whether you feel safe. It's safe for you. Like if you have kids, some people would you know like take the round out of the chamber and just on their gun. Some people would be able to round in. It was just up to you and what you felt was safe. Was there was there any prohibition against leaving, say, the shotgun in, in the truck? No, I I felt the same Well, any prohibition about leaving that AR-15 in the truck? No, I think that was, that was okay. But both you and Mr. Bar Martin decided to bring your handguns into the hotel, right? Yes. And could you explain to the jury just your your thoughts on 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 why you would bring your handgun into the hotel in the, in the bag? Well, I've been, they're just always on you. As a police officer, you're just always on your hand gun. So we walked in, and we were just got off the job, so we walked in with every, with all the weird we had for the job that day. And now we were wearing polo shirts and you know, khaki pants, and we had our firearms and our badges displayed, so that's how we walked into the hotel. So when you walked into the hotel, there, there was no mystery that you were law enforcement, right? Right. And you were, you were displaying your sidearm on your belt? Right. Along with your badge? Right. And, uh, the, the shirts you were wearing, do they say Sheriff's Department or Law Enforcement or something? I don't think so. I think it's the black polo shirt. But that's your transport uniform, right? Yeah. It, it, you weren't wearing the uniforms that we normally see when a police officer pulls us over for speeding. It was more of a utility uniform. No, right, right. All right. And when you got into the room, um, did, um, did, did you know that Mr. Martin had, um, had firearms? Well, we got into the room and we both you know, changed out of our polo and khaki clothes and um, we put on regular street clothes, casual clothes. 
objection on responsive. And um, we then, Jeremy asked me where to go to put your gun. And I said, well, I'm going to put it in my bag. I think it'll be okay there. And then Jeremy said, okay. And then he said, well, what could I have? And he showed me uh, a 9mm, uh, I believe it was Springfield. And he had it in like a concealed carry case or a holster. And they said, I have this in my box. I was like, oh, cool. Man. Explain for the jury, if you will, what a concealed carry holster is versus maybe like a holster that you wear on your belt. Well, concealed carry holster is like a holster where you can put the firearm inside your pants and it can be hidden. And the sprinkle we had was kind of a smaller 9mm gun, so it was meant to go inside his pants or somewhere that you can have it not visible. And it is, um, it is the possession of, of a second firearm, is that somehow uh, contrary to department policy? Um, I believe you can have a, a second firearm which you qualify with it and have to do certain things and get approved and stuff. I don't know if he did that. I don't know if he just had it. I don't know. You don't have any reason to believe that Mr. Martin didn't have this gun lawfully, right? No. And that, that Springfield, the, the Glock is, is a regular size, a regular size firearm, right? Right, correct. But the Springfield, it's not a tiny subcompact, but it's more of a, of a concealed carry kind of weapon, is it not? Yeah, it's pretty thin, and it, it's good, it's okay. Yeah. And it has a more narrow grip, right? Right. Uh, we've seen photographs of the clip or the magazine that only holds a certain amount where the, where the Glock has a, a wider grip to hold more. Right, that's correct. It's, it's, it's easier to see on the magazine. And, and you specifically saw the holster, the type of holster, and that was a concealed carry holster, right? Right, yeah, you showed me everything. Now, let's talk for a moment about um, the way your gun was loaded, if we, if we can, okay? You've seen photographs of, of, your, of your pistol, right? You know that gun well. Yes, sir. And you've seen photographs of the magazine, right? Yes, sir. And you've heard testimony about, um, about the number of, um, of live cartridges that were still in the gun, right? And the number of shell cases. Yes. So tell the jury, if you will, what your policy, what, what your routine was in loading that magazine. Well, what I did, um, I would put 15 rounds in the magazine, insert the magazine into the gun, and then rack the round. And that was it. And some, some people, I think it's just personal preference, but some people, you know, put 15 rounds in the magazine, insert the magazine into the gun, rack the round, and then they take the magazine out and they put another round in. So they have 15 rounds in the magazine and then one in the chamber. Is there a particular reason that you would have only 14 in the magazine and one in the chamber? Yes, um, I did that way because it works that your screen is faster in the magazine and you have it fully loaded all the time. And why is that? And because the spring is compressed to its capacity well, for a long time. That's loaded. And is this just personal preference among different officers? Yeah, just personal preference. I, I had to submit for more more magazines with my department it was kind of a hassle and uh, when your magazine springs aren't as strong as they should be it causes your gun to malfunction. And on this day, um, is, is it your testimony that there were 15 live rounds in your gun when you placed it in the bag, there were 14 in the magazine and one in the chamber? Yes sir. Okay, so when you began the afternoon, uh, where did you go first? Or after you, after you dressed in your street clothes and went out, where did you go first? Uh, we went to Farley's. It was like right across the street. And why did you go to Farley's? Uh, I think the closest. And I mean, I knew they had pool tables and pool place hanging out. And how much did you drink at Farley's? I want to say like two or three beers. That's what I remember. And if you know, was um, how much did Mr. Um, Mr. Martin can see. He had to see. And you've seen a text, uh, text messages have been introduced about uh, we're playing pool. Yeah, we're playing pool. Playing pool. And so that text message is consistent with what you were doing, right? Yes. Okay. And how long were you at Farms? Uh, I think it was like an hour. Okay. Where did you go next? Um, next we walked to, to El Vega to check it out. And it was kind of dead. There was like no wind in it, so we decided not to stay there. Did, did you purchase any alcohol or any food at De La Vega? No, we didn't. Where did you go next? Next we walked to Hooters. 
And by the time you got to Hooters, had the Cowboys game started? Yeah, the Cowboys game, I believe, was just starting. And what time does Monday Night Football usually start? 6.30? 6, 6.30, 6, I think. Okay. And when you walked in, did you have to wait for the game to start, or was it still the pregame, or had that kickoff already happened? I don't remember. I, I want to say the game was just starting, but it's hard to recall. Okay. And when, while you were at Hooters, uh, did you order food? Yeah, we ordered wings. Okay. And did you purchase beer or other types of liquor? Yeah, we, we got a pitcher of beer. Does, uh, does, does that Hooters have a liquor license? I mean, if you wanted to, could you have shots and stuff there? I'm not sure. Okay. But you didn't have any shots or any mixed drinks at Hooters, right? No, we just had beer. Okay. And that was, you bought a pitcher, the young woman brought the pitcher, you drank it, and that was it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And so after you finished at Hooters, um, was, was the Cowboys game still on? Yeah, the Cowboys game was still on. But you left before it was over, right? Right, we left, we got finished eating. And where did you go next? We went to the, I guess it's like a club in Hotel Franco called the Zool. And what was the mood like between you and Mr. Martin um, at Farley's and at De La Vega when he walked there and at Hooters? What was the mood like between you? It was fine. I think we were having a good time. Okay. Nothing out of the ordinary? No, nothing out of the ordinary. And when you went to the, uh, the, the hotel, Azul, went, went to the Azul, the hotel bar in Cantano, at the Encanto, um, what did you do there? Uh, there wasn't very many people there, but we, um, we got to see at the bar, talking to the bartender, who's very friendly. And they had a little screen, so we were still watching the Cowboys game. Okay. And were there any activities going on in the hotel that, that, that drew your attention? Um, yeah, the bartender said there was some kind of a band downstairs because we were like, what's going on here? Is there anything special? And he said there's some kind of band, but he didn't know what was going on in the pool, so we thought we'd go check it out and see what's going on. But it was like, it looked like something really important. People were down there and it looked like just exclusive. So. Like a fancy party where yeah, you guys... Yeah, like a fancy, rich party. So we're like, oh, this is fancy. Okay. So you didn't go there. Did, did, you, um, did you go back into the Azul? Yes, we went back into the Azul. And how much did uh, how much alcohol did the two of you consume at the Azul, if you know? I don't remember. It was at least one. Okay. And at any time, did you make a phone call to a friend of yours? Yeah, I called my, my friend Josh. Okay. And Josh has testified. You heard him yesterday. He's, you, he's known you since you were, you were little, right? Yes, sir. And at some point in time, you went to different middle schools, but you knew each other well growing up, right? Mm -hmm. did, yes. you, did he live in El Dorado too? Did you live in the same neighborhood? Yes, he lived in El Dorado. Okay. Did you both go to El, El Dorado Elementary? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, but you parted ways when you were in different middle schools, right? In different yes. high schools? Different middle schools. Okay. And when Josh testifies that you became friends again um, after a few years when you, when you were in college, that, that, was, that was true, right? Yeah. And would you characterize Josh as a good friend? Yes, he's very good friend. The, um, you, you were in the same fraternity together, right? Yes, we were. Were you in the same pledge class? No. I'll rephrase the question. Um, did you join the same fraternity as Josh? Yes, we joined the same fraternity. Were you in the same pledge class? No, I, I joined before him. He joined a year and a half later. Were you roommates at some point in time? Yes, we were. Uh, for how many years were you roommates? I believe it was one year. One year. Is he close enough of a friend that you would uh, be concerned for his safety if you, if you thought something happened to him? Yes, he's close. So you called Josh. What happened? I called Josh and said, you want to you know, hang out? Go to Dublin's? And why Dublin's? Well, I figured it made it more busy than the places we were, we were at. And without talking specifically about what Josh said, were plans made to um, go out? Yes, he said he would come pick us up. How long did you have to wait at the Encanto before Josh got there? Uh, not too long. We, we had another drink at Gardino's before he came. I think that was the age of all. Okay. And tell the jury, for those 
who don't know what a Jaeger bomb is. Tell them what a Jaeger bomb is. Um, it's a uh, shot of um, Jaeger Monster and then some Red Bull. And I believe they had like a special cup, so they had like a shot in the cup, so they poured like the Jaeger in it, and then they poured the Red Bull around it, and you just drink it. And you shoot it down, it's not something you sip on like classy drinking, right? No, you just shoot it. All right. The, um, when, when Josh arrived in the Encanto, was somebody with him? Yes, Ian was with him. And now do you, how well do you know Ian Robles? We hung out a few times when I was going to school. Do you consider Ian Robles um, the on the same level of friendship as, um, as Josh, sex ed? Yeah. Have you ever been roommates with, with Ian Robles? No, I haven't. So what's the, um, when you get into the car, when you get in with Josh and Ian, what's the, what's the demeanor between you and Jeremy? I thought it was fine. I know Jeremy was kind of making comments towards me, but I was just, you know, it didn't phase me anyway. Okay. What, what were the comments? I was saying I was a okay. did, um, uh, did you get upset about that? No, I took it as he was joking. Did, uh, what was your level of intoxication? I was on three buzz at this point. Okay. And did Jeremy, from, from what you knew, had you and Jeremy Martin consumed basically the same amount of alcohol up to the moment that you got into the car with Josh and with, with Josh and Ian? Yeah, it is. Had any, either one of you been drinking more heavily than the other? No. When you got to Dublin's, what happens next? Um, we got to Dublin's, we walked in and sat at a table close to the bar. And who was there? It was me, Josh, Ian, and Jeremy. At some point in time, did somebody else join you? Yeah, yeah. I texted my cousin Nicole to, uh, she could be coming out with us. I also texted my, I texted my cousin Art too, but he, he had some, a lab or some school with you, so he could be. And your cousin Nicole, she came a little bit later, right? Yeah, she came later. And, and your, your understanding was that she had something to do, but she would come out to see even though it was a school night, right? Right. right. Okay. So at any time while you were at Dublin's, did the mood change between you and Jeremy Martin? I uh, guess it did. Tell the jury what happened and why, why you believe the mood changed. Well, we were, we were talking at the table, and Jeremy brought up the double homicide, and he said that there were two kids in the double homicide that got shot in the head. Well, I don't, I don't know one got shot in the head, I don't know about the other one. But they were in the front seat. And um, Jeremy said, those kids deserve to die because they were, they were criminals. They were going to just grow up to be career criminals. And my argument was they, they did not deserve to die. They could, you know, grow up and change their lives. And it started to get kind of heated. And did that argument progress any farther? Yeah, I was getting kind of heated, so I, I believed that. Well, on the way over, he said that he was the first responder in that double homicide. He was one of the first ones on scene. That's what I, I thought. So during that conversation, I said, well, you killed him. You didn't get there in time. And it was kind of like to lighten the mood, to kind of, you know, diffuse the situation. In retrospect, was that insensitive? Yeah, it was an insensitive comment. Did you mean it literally? Were you trying to imply that Jeremy Martin was responsible for anybody's murder? No, not at all. Not at all. I thought he would just take it. I was like, yeah, right, man. How could I cause that? Be worried that by the time I'll try to it. You heard Josh testify that you were being pretty annoying, right? Yeah. And in, in retrospect? Yeah, it could have been taken wrong. In fact, you were being pretty annoying, were you not? I was probably being pretty annoying, yes. The, but after you and, and Jeremy, there, there's this exchange, did the mood, uh, what was the mood like between the two of you? Well, when I said that, he like looked at me with a blank stare and said, what did you say? And I said, you killed him, and you didn't get there in time. And then he, like, what did you say? And then he got really upset, like a blank stare on his face, and he was just sitting there staring at me. Um, and I said, I'm sorry, man, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm just joking with a joke. Did, um, did at any point, 
Mr. Martin leave the bar? Yeah, and then I was talking, and then Nicole arrived, so I started talking to Nicole, so I didn't see him, I just get up and leave. But at some point you realized that he had left the bar, right? Yeah, I realized he'd been gone for a while. Okay. Did, um, at any time, you make an attempt to contact him by, by your cellular phone? Yeah, I, tried, I was like, where is he, man? Because he'd been gone for a while. And you've seen the text messages uh, between the two of you, right? Right. And do you recall uh, expressing some concern about, uh, about his whereabouts? Yes. And what, if anything, um, in response to that concern, was relayed to you by Mr. Martin? Well, I was, I was like, learning man, and he said, oh, I'm having a chew. And I said, oh, thank God. I was worried about you. And he said, anyways. And was there ever any time that um, they, that you um, again asked him if things were okay between the two of you? Yeah, he came back in and he was his mood had changed. He just didn't like me anymore. So I was like, "Man, are we cool?" And he said, "I'm cool." And I said, like, "No, man, are we cool? I'm serious, are we cool?" And he said, "I know I'm cool." So after this exchange, did um, was there ever any physical altercation between the two of you? No. Was there any pushing or shoving? No. Were voices raised? Uh, a little bit. I wasn't like, screaming. And was he screaming at you? No. Was it more of a low grade? Um, yeah, it was like a, it like a, maybe a loud conversation. At some point in time, the decision is made to, to leave, right? Right. Did, uh, did you leave before Josh? No, Josh left before. And, and Ian left as well, right? Josh and Ian left. And what arrangements were made for you to get back in contact? Well, I know Josh was just getting there. He had to get called a taxi. And then um, I know Jeremy wanted to leave. And Nicole said she would drive us home. Okay. And Nicole had not been drinking alcohol at all, right? Right. So did you uh, take Nicole up on her uh, offer to give you a ride? Yeah. During the ride back from Encanto to back from Dublin to Encanto, um, was there? Um, do you remember any conversations in the vehicle in the car? I remember thanking Nicole and being sorry that we were putting her off for school. I know she had school the next day, and we were making her drive, making having her drive us back. And I was like, sorry, I'm going to make you do this, but thanks. Do you remember perhaps being kind of annoying to Nicole? Before? Yeah, I was probably being a little over. When you got to the hotel, uh, oh, during during the ride back and back from uh, the Dublin to the Encanto, uh, were there any more arguments between you and Jerry? No. And when you got to the hotel, uh, tell me what happened. Tell the jury what happened. Well, I remember him, you know, helping me out of the, out of the truck and kind of helping me into the elevator. I remember thinking I didn't really need help, but I was kind of just going along with it, you know. It's like, oh, okay, cool. And you'd had a lot to drink, right? Yeah. And you had, you'd had more to drink than Mr. Martin, right? Yeah, I believe he started drinking um, a water. About what time? I don't know. But he said, I'm drinking water. And I was like, okay, it's all going to buy another drink. And what happened, if anything, when you entered the hotel? We entered the hotel and we went up to the room. Did you both have room keys? Yes, but I had room keys. And during the elevator ride, or the walk from the elevator to the room, was anything, uh, anything transpired between the two? I don't believe so. Had you taken your weapons with you to the hotel, to the, from the hotel to the bar that night? No. The, is there, uh, are there prohibitions within your department about carrying your handguns when you've been drinking? Yeah, you can carry them. And, um, and you were certainly off duty when you were uh, at the bar, right? Correct. Okay. When you walked into the hotel room, do you know what time it was? I don't, I don't remember. Was anything, it, what, did anything, what happened immediately upon your entry into the hotel room uh, after you returned from Dublin? I remember you brought up the double homicide again and started arguing with me about why I would ever Why are we sorry? This is a joke. I was just making a joke, you know. And 
and I was thinking, why was Zara coming? He was getting more and more upset. And he said, he started saying, like, he's like, I'm gonna frame you for murder. And he started pushing me. And I was, I was like, I remember just being, it was so weird and I didn't really know what was going on. And then um, all I remember is him pushing me and then he, he tried kicking me in the balls and I kind of moved my leg, he didn't really connect with kicking me in the balls, but it was so weird and he was just getting really angry and then he went into the bathroom. Okay. And what's your, what are you feeling at this point? I was so confused, I didn't really know what was going on. Some of that confusion perhaps have to do with your level of intoxication. Well, it was, I was, I was intoxicated and it was confusing to have someone say I'm afraid for her and just start getting I'm really upset over something that I thought was just a joke. Have you ever been kicked in the groin by your partner? No. Now, the, the, the strike or the blow to the groin, was it with his foot, with his knee, what was it? I remember he tried moving his foot, but he didn't, I just kind of like moved my leg and he didn't really kick me his foot. And what action, if any, did you take following this confrontation. When we went to the bathroom, I, I left the hotel room, I ran out the door, and I went down, I remember being down the lobby, and down and ran across the street, and I called um, my wife, Melia. And why did you leave the hotel? Well, because I couldn't think of anything better to do. I, he was acting so weird and bizarre. And it was like everything, I was trying to calm it down, and nothing was working. Why didn't you just call 911? I didn't, I was, I don't know, I didn't really know what was going on and I didn't want to get my, my partner in trouble for just like some drunk at night. We had to go to work the next day and drive back and you know, those were normal duty duties. I, I was, I was going to be, um, on the end of that Wednesday, I was going to be, um, I don't know how to say it, the U.S. Marshals were going to uh, swear me in to be a task force officer with the U.S. Marshals. And so, did you try to defuse the situation? Yeah, I remember just trying to like, you know, calm him down and nothing was working and it didn't, nothing was working and he just, he didn't like me and I just left, I was going to think I do it. And how long were you gone? I don't remember, I remember talking on the phone with Leah. I don't remember exactly what I was saying, but I remember being like, so confused and, and scared at the same time, but it was more, just confusion because what happened is so it's so weird and strange. And did you really think that Jeremy was going to try to frame you for a murder, or did that make any sense to you at all? It didn't make sense. I mean, someone to say that to you, and I, it didn't make sense. It was just so bizarre and, and weird. Where did you go? I remember being by, by like Golden Corral and um, Sonic and by the bank in that area, like right across from Farley's. And where I mean, not from Farley's. From the hotel? From the hotel, yes. And did you at any time um, call, I think you said you called Leah, right? Yeah, I called Leah. And what happened during that call with, with Leah? Do you remember talking to her? I remember talking to her. I don't exactly remember what I was saying to her. I remember just being so confused and, and scared. And what happened, if anything, um, while you were outside the hotel? I remember just being outside the hotel walking around and talking on the phone. At some point in time, did Mr. Martin come to find you? Yeah, Jeremy found me. I don't remember where, but I know he came and found me. And did the two of you uh, go back into the hotel? Yeah, we, we walked. He was, we were walking back into the hotel, into the elevator. And you, you, you've seen video footage, and the footage is unremarkable. You know you walked into the hotel together, right? Yes. Did you go into the elevator? Yes, we did. And when you went back into the elevator, went back to the hotel with Mr. Martin, what happened next? Well, he was saying, like, he was saying, I love you, man, I know I love you, man. So I was like, okay, maybe we're working stuff out now, and maybe we can work it out. We had to work, and we, I knew we had to work the next day. So we had to resolve this issue because we, were, we had a job to do the next day. And that job included being in the car for four hours? Yeah, had to drive back to San You know? I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, he was saying, I love you, man, so I was saying, I love you, man, back. And, and he was saying, nobody's going to jail tonight, no one's going to jail tonight. And I, was, I was like, okay. And what did that mean to you, if anything? It was just weird. Like, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about anybody going to jail. And 
And you'd already said that you didn't call 911 because you didn't want anybody to get in trouble, right? Right, yeah, I did. I thought that was a strange time for him to say that. So you, you got in the elevator, you, you rode back up to the seventh floor, correct? Yes. What happens between the elevator and the hotel room door, 7 Eleven? I don't remember. I don't remember if we were talking or we were just walking back to the room. Who used the key to enter the room? I remember Jeremy opening the door. And it's like, okay, now, when you entered the room, do you recall what the lighting was like? Was the overheads on? Was it real bright or was it dim? If you can remember. I remember it was kind of dim. It wasn't all of the time. The, um, what happens when you enter the, enter the hotel? I enter the room and I remember going into the bathroom. And then, um, I don't know if I called Leah or she called me or what happened. I remember talking to Leah on the cell phone. Do you remember Leah calling you more than once? I, I don't remember. And you've heard, you've seen the phone records and you've heard testimony about uh, Leah calling you several times? Yes, I, just, I don't remember. I remember just talking to her on the phone. Where were you when you were talking to her on the telephone? At this point I was in the bathroom. Okay. And was the bathroom door locked? Uh, yes, it was. Why did you have yourself locked in the bathroom? Um, at this point I was scared. I didn't know what was going on in Jeremy. You've been acting strange. I wanted to work everything out. And when you were in the bathroom, were you talking to Leah on the telephone? Yes, I was. What happened next? Uh, I remember hearing a banging on the door. Open the fucking door, open the fucking door. And really loud and really aggressive. Now, with the bathroom door closed, had you, be, had you been aware while you were in the bathroom what Mr. Martin was doing outside in the hotel room? No, I was just in the bathroom talking. Up to this point, had you seen Mr. Martin with a weapon? No. What happens after Mr. Martin says to you, open the fucking door, in a loud voice, not banging on the door? After he's yelling, open the fucking door, open the fucking door. I opened the door, and I remember yelling, sit down, sit down, because he was, I had to meet his, open the fucking door, and I wanted him to sit down so we could talk it all over. So he was walking, I remember him walking back to, the area, the, the desk and the chair in the far side of the room. Let me stop you right there. When you say you had to yell at him, you would yell at him, is that part of your training? Yeah, it was like the diffuse situation. It just, I just wanted him to sit down so we could talk about what was going on. And is that, a, is that are you taught to give commands? Yes. Are you taught to give commands? Uh, is that part of your training to give commands to diffuse or give commands to the people who you want them to do something? Yes. And is that part of your training? Yes, it is. So you, you yell to Mr. Martin, sit down, sit down, right? Yes, sit down, sit down. What happens next? So he, he was walking back to the, to the desk in the chair, and it was like a casual walk. So I thought he was just going to sit down, and he turned around, and he had a gun in his hand. What happened next? So he had a gun in his hand, and it was his left hand. And he, he looked at me with uh, this plain stare, like, I got like he was looking straight through me. I'll never forget that look he gave me, and he just said, "I'm gonna shoot you." Like just nonchalant, a monotone voice. Like, I'm gonna shoot you. And do you know Mr. Martin to be left or right-handed? I knew on the way over we were talking. He was. He said he was left-handed. What happened next? Okay, so he had the gun in his hand, and he said, "I'm gonna shoot you." And I remember him just lifting the gun up so fast, pointing at me. And I don't, I, I mean, at that point I was just like, I think I was just frozen and I, I thought it was, that was it. And then I just remember getting hit in the face. I remember the pain in my face and I was going to the ground and he was hitting me with a gun in his hand. Do you know if he was hitting you with the barrel of the gun, the butt of the gun? I didn't know. I, I thought, I, I don't know, I was getting hit. And I knew he had a gun in his hand, and I, I thought, this is it, this is I'm, I'm dead. And where was all this taking place? Uh, I don't remember. It was just so chaotic. Well, was it in the room 7-Eleven? Yeah. Okay. At any time, do you remember tasting blood or feeling blood or realizing that you were bleeding on your face? No, I just remember the pain in my face and then him with the gun. And then I was focused in on the gun after that, so I started to struggle and, and grab and reach. And, and then shots were, were, were going off, and I didn't have the gun. Okay, so 
tell the jury very specifically when you were able to get control of the gun. Well, it was just so chaotic. Like, I don't I remember trying to reach for the gun and struggling for the gun to go home gun, and I was getting, I was getting repeatedly punched. I just remember just pain in my face. And I, I remember grabbing the gun and knowing that I had, had the gun. So I was like, I have the gun. And I didn't know if I was shot. I didn't know because the shots were fired before I, I, I had the gun. Do you remember how many? I, I remember one. And I don't remember after that, but it was just like the, I just remember the ringing in my ears. What happened next? After that, I, I had the gun, and I was thinking to myself, I have this gun, don't let go of this gun. And I, 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 I turned the gun away from me, so the barrel was away from me. And I turned it down as hard as I possibly could, and I went to the ground. As hard as I could. Like, like I knew if I let go of this gun, I was going to die. So I grabbed the gun, and I went down as hard as I could. Take the gun away from Mr. Mark. Yeah, I got the gun. I got it out of his hand. I went out. I had the gun. I turned around and I just started shooting. Did you start? Do you remember how many shots you fired? I don't remember. I remember I shot the gun, and then I knew he could have a gun, another gun. So I ran out, and I knew that because I saw him run out, and I shot, and I knew that if he ran out, and he could still have a gun and turn around and come back and shoot me. So I ran out the door and just started shooting. And I remember him running away and then saying, okay, he's gone, I can stop shooting. So I stopped shooting. And I, I remember saying that when one and I was running down the hallway and I was breaking down the door, so I was saying, help me. Hold on, would you like a glass of water? You need to stop for a second. So you said you exited the room and you kept shooting? Yeah, I kept shooting because I didn't know if he was outside with a gun. Okay, once I stepped into those a threat, I knew that if I just walked out, he could just shoot me right there because he had another gun. So I walked down and I just shot and just kept shooting until I realized he was running away and I stopped. All right, now. And I didn't see, I was shooting and he was running and I didn't see, I was hitting him, I didn't see, he just kept running and I stopped. And when you saw Mr. Martin running away, did he ever go to the ground? Did you no, saw I just saw him running away. Did he ever stumble or go to one knee? No, he just ran, he was running away. Did he ever lean against the wall that you saw, like showing you the support? No, he was just running and I stopped. And when you stopped firing, what action did you take? I started yelling, calling him one. And we were going and banging on people's doors because I was thinking, I can hide in someone's room, and he'll never find me. Which direction did you run initially? I ran the opposite direction. And what were you specifically saying? I was saying sheriff's office, sheriff's office opened the door, and I was banging on people's doors to just get someone to help me. Nobody was helping me. And are you trained? You've already talked about training. Um, was there anything about that hotel hallway that you thought was dangerous? Yeah, that whole hallway was dangerous. I needed to get out of that hallway as soon as I can. There's so many threats. It's the only place where people can hide. Did you think about going back into your room? I didn't want to go in there because I knew he knew that that's where I would go. So he would come. That was the only place he could find me. Now, we saw in some photographs some pairs of shoes on the ground. Were those your shoes? Yes, the ones. The ones that are kind of stoned on the floor? Yeah, the black ones. When you got arrested, you didn't have any shoes on, did you? No. When the shooting started, did you have shoes on? Yeah, I had shoes on. How did the shoes get off, if you remember? I don't remember. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. But when you were arrested, you had no shoes on, right? Right. And as you were running down the hallway, what do you remember thinking? I remember thinking, I need help. Someone help me. I need to get out of this hallway. And I remember thinking, someone go open the door and let me hide. And no one did. I remember thinking, no one's helping me. No one's helping me. 
Why did you think you needed to hide, Ty? I wanted to hide from Jeremy. I wanted to hide from me. He was going to kill me. All right. And ultimately, you ran the direction toward the elevators, right? Yeah, I started running just to get out of the hallway and somewhere where I didn't have so many threads and so many places where people could hide. And when you say threads, are you talking about the hallway itself? I'm thinking the hallway, there was doors that were kind of set in deep so people could hide and there was a lot of places where people could hide. Blind corners and such? Blind corners. Why didn't you go down the elevator? I didn't want to go up to the elevator and press the button and stand there and wait for it. I mean, you have to wait for an elevator to open, so I didn't want to press the button and just sit there and wait. So I was trying to find a place quick to hide. And I, I went into the stairwell and I, I looked at my hands and there was blood over my hands. So I started checking myself for holes to see if I had been shot. And then I, I, I noticed I wasn't shot. So I ran up to the stairwell and saw that door, that hatch, and I tried to get out and I was like, okay, it's, it's locked there. I can't go out that way. So I turned around on the stairs and I realized that I just had the door as a threat and then the stairwell. So I can look at those in one like field of vision and see, you know, what was kind of going on. So I, I sat down on the, on the stairs and had my gun and I remember just shaking uncontrollably holding my gun. And at that point I think I realized that it was my gun and I was shaking. Up to that point did you realize you were holding your own handgun? Yeah, at that point I realized it was my gun and I remember I couldn't hold my, my hand. Straight, like still, it was just like I couldn't. It was. And when you talk about um, the, the, the watching the door for a threat, yeah, was this is this based on your training? Yeah, I knew the threat. I knew Jeremy was out there. He was going to come. I think he was going to come. He was going to come through that door or the stairs. And why did you think the position with your back to that outer door was a, a, a good defensive position? Well, I had no threads to my back. So it was just the stairs up by the locked door, and I had nothing here. So I was all here, and I could see it all. And I was just holding that, holding that position and shaking. And we say holding that position for those of us not in law enforcement or in the service or the military. What's that mean, holding that position? Well, I just had my gun. And hold, I pointed at the door and shaking. And control. At any point in time, did you hear a commotion in the stairwell? Yeah, I heard. I heard the dog and the cops. And they were announcing themselves, so then I was relieved. I was saying, oh, they're here, so I started announcing myself. Did you ever try to move away or to avoid detection by the police? No, I was happy they were there. And when you heard, um, there's been testimony about there's some dog barking, zero, right? Yeah. Did you hear zero barking? Yeah, I remember hearing the dog barking. And did you, what did you suspect the dog had? Did you, did you think it was some stray dog, or did you think you No, I, I knew it was. We have police and coming. So I thought I'd just hold this door, store for my safety and their safety. Okay. And why did you why were you concerned for their safety? Because they were coming up the stairs and I had the threat area, the door. And did you ever see Mr. Martin after after you shot the last the tenth round and you ran the other direction? Did you see where he went? No. And did you ever see him lying in the elevator? Did you ever see him lying in a pool of his own blood? No. What happened when the officers reached the landing just below you? They started calling out, and I, I started calling out, saying, and I wanted to, to, to let them know that I, I heard what they were saying. And why did you tell them you were armed? Just to let them know, because I know that's important, to let the police officers know you're armed is huge. Did you ever try to hold back any information from law enforcement officers as they were coming up the stairs? No, I was trying to convey my fear and, what happened? Is let me ask you this, Ty. How? What was your emotional state after the shooting while you were waiting in the uh, in, in the in the stairwell? That's most fear I've ever had in my life. I don't, I don't even think you can say that in words. Just fear, like when I just can. When you see like horror movies and like you know they're shaking in terror, that's. That, I can really that that's that can happen, that's real. You've been in stressful situations on your job though, right? Yeah, I've been in stressful situations. Was your feeling this night different from those work related? Very different. You've heard testimony and you've heard the audio about uh, when the officer was uh, asking you, telling you, commanding you to come down, right? Right, yes. And you can be heard uh, respond. Right. Were you trying to hide anything? 
you know, I was scared for their safety. And what is your badge number? My badge number is 7111. And what was your room number? 7111. In retrospect, might there have been some confusion about badge number versus room number? Yeah, it's pretty confusing. Were you purposely trying to mislead any of the officers? No. Now, when um, what what happened after you were taken into custody? I was just I was so scared for everybody, all the cops going in, like this guy just tried to kill me. So I was scared for everybody there to not go in and try to convey the danger that was that was in through that door. When were you made aware, first made aware, that Mr. Martin had been shot? Oh, uh, that was when the detective told me. Like, that was what, six hours after. Had you been made aware at any point, up at the time, six hours later, that you had in fact shot Jeremy Martin? No. Did you have any reason to believe that you had struck Jeremy Martin with a bullet from your gun until you were informed six hours later that he was dead? No, I thought he was still in the hotel room or in the hotel. The, um, you've heard the recording from the time you were taken into custody until the time that uh, you're questioned by the police, right? Right. You say some pretty crazy things. Yeah. Crazy. What were you feeling immediately upon, um, what were you feeling when you were walking through the hotel lobby? Well, when I was walking through the lobby, it just seemed like everybody was so, like, not, like, just walking. They weren't taking like precautions that I thought they needed to with the danger that was up there. So I was just conveying to all the cops, you know, be careful, be careful, don't, like, don't go in there, like, be careful. And did people seem to be responding? No, they just kept like walking past me or like just shrugging me off. Like it, I couldn't get my point across that it was very dangerous in there. And you said that there was a bomb in the hotel. In retrospect, there was no bomb in the hotel, was there? There was no bomb. I said that because no one was conveying the level of danger that I just, I just faced and nobody was taking me seriously. So I was saying, get everybody out of the hotel room. And there's a, I was saying, there's a bomb. And I was like, who cares if there's a bomb? I just said there was a bomb. Get everybody out. I didn't want anybody to die. Nobody needed to get hurt. And I didn't know if I hit Jeremy. I didn't know what was going on. I thought he was still out there going to kill people or a cop. No, so I was saying, I'm scared for you. I'm scared for your family. I'm scared for everybody up there. When you were telling those police officers that you were scared for them, was that genuine? Yeah. Did you want anybody to get hurt? No. Ty, when you and Jeremy Martin returned to the hotel from drinking, did you have a plan to kill him? No, no, not at all. Did you have any motivation to murder Jeremy Martin? No. Did you have an intent to shoot him in the Objection. back? Objection. Sustained. Again, gentlemen, but Mr. Clark has been meeting the witness throughout the testimony. And so at the beginning, there comes an objection after he's been meeting the meeting the meeting. Well, if all of that information has already been testified to by other witnesses, then it's fine to the court to get that out of the way. But we're at a point right now where the information has to be coming from the defendant. Got so from this point on, and earlier, there had been an earlier objection. Don't be the witness. Okay. Go ahead. So what was your motivation for pulling the trigger and firing at Jeremy Martin? He was going to kill me. I had to defend myself. When you were in the police car, did you tell the officers anything about self-defense? Yeah, I was, telling, I was saying he shot at me. He shot at me up there. He's crazy. He's going to kill people. He's a, a guy I just was with and was drinking with and having fun with just tried to kill me. And were you telling the police officers the truth when you told them that he shot at you first? Yeah, it was all the truth. That you were acting in self-defense? Yes. May I have a moment, Judge? Yes, go ahead. Can I pass words? Thank you. Mr. Clark, this is your witness. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead and proceed with your cross examination, Mr. Chairman.
Let's talk about that use of force model. Now, on direct examination, you said that you can't use deadly force against a non-deadly attack, right? Right. And you also said that you have trained on this. You, you trained on it in the academy. And you had a, uh, a long block of training on it, right? Right. You also sat here throughout the pendency of this, uh, the duration of this trial, and you listened to uh, Deputy Brian Brandon. Isn't that right? Yes. And you listened to him whenever I asked if there was any additional training over and above what regular patrol deputies have concerning defensive tactics, hand-to-hand, -hand, weapons retention, anything like that, specifically for SWAT officers. And you heard him say no. Right. Isn't that right? But you come into court today and you say that, oh, well, I received some additional training in uh, basic SWAT and jujitsu. So who's telling the truth? Well, the, the TAP-1 agency that came to our department, um, they can train a lot of people, but there are specific officers that are chosen to attend that training. So it wasn't, I attended that training with uh, people from my department, not just, that wasn't for a slot, that was just for a select number of group that they chose to attend this training. And so what you're saying is that uh, Deputy Brandon is lying? No, yeah, he wasn't lying. He, um, we didn't get, for the SWAT team, we didn't, we didn't learn self-defense, but this wasn't related to the SWAT team. This was just a training that our agency had available to them, and they selected some people to take, to go into the training. Now, you said that, uh, that the weapon deflection method that was described by Captain Gonzalez is the one that's taught in uh, the basic academy training, right? Yes, I did. Okay. And <clears throat> you've been on the SWAT team for how long? at the time of this crime? Um, I think it was close to two years. For two years. Now during that, uh, now during direct examination, you had an opportunity to tell Mr. Clark exactly how many times you, you'd used that maneuver, isn't that right? I'm um, sorry, can you repeat that? Sure, you didn't tell Mr. Clark how many times you practiced that maneuver, isn't that right? Right, it was And if you, if you have a, if you have a, physical skill set and you don't use it, you lose it, don't you? I don't know. You do know. I wouldn't say you lose your physical skill set. Well, let me ask you this, the question this way. Officers are required to qualify frequently with their firearm, aren't they? Yes, sir. Isn't that a physical skill set? Sure. If you don't fire frequently and maintain proficiency, you lose it, don't you? I guess you'd say that. No, no guessing to it. You bet your life on it, don't you? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's practice, it's training, so the more you practice, the better you get. So. You said that during this block of training at the academy, the officers or deputies are taught to take the weapon and push it hard down. Isn't that right? Yeah, push it down. Over the thumb. Like roll it over the thumb. Roll it over the thumb. Push it down. Right. If you push it down, the bullet's going to go down, isn't it? What well, at that point? The bounds of the shot will come like that. That's not answering my question. If you push it down, the bullet's going to go down, isn't it? If the gun is fired while you're trying to get it away, it depends on when the barrel is. But and it did go down. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so that doesn't account for the bullet in the overhead, does it? Well, the answer, it doesn't account for that. Now. We talked about uh, this concealed carry holster. Well, first let me back up. <clears throat> the question was whether or not the Glock 31 is a regular pistol. It's your duty weapon, isn't it? Yes, sir. Officers who are uh, on patrol or they're uh, commissioned by the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office, that's what they use, right? Yes, and they can, they can purchase their own weapon, but they have to qualify with it. Have to approve. And it's... Uh, it's regular for what their, their purpose is, isn't that correct? And their purpose is on patrol. 
Yeah. And if you have a different purpose, then you use a different weapon. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so if, you ha if you're an undercover narcotics agent, for example, you're not going to be carrying a full-size Glock, are you? Yeah, you can have a concealed weapon. You can have a concealed, but it's most likely, if you want to keep it concealed and not print and, and not show and, and be unobtrusive, you're going to carry a smaller weapon, aren't you? Sure. Okay. Let's go to your short-barreled AR-15. It's not a standard AR-15, right? Sure. Barrels cut down, isn't it? Yes, sir. And that allows you to go around corners and maneuver inside tight spaces, inside a house, inside an apartment, inside a stairwell, or anything else like that, right? Yes, sir. Size suited for purpose. Yes. So if a deputy has a secondary sidearm, he's either going to be carrying it on his ankle or in a holster in a smaller back or on the hip or something else like that. Not like a duty weapon that would either be strapped to the thigh or on a Sam Brown belt or something like that, right? Right, it's going to be like in his clothing somewhere hidden. Now you saw this testimony in this trial and you saw the state's exhibit that showed Jeremy Martin's bag and both of those firearms were in the bag and in the holster, right? Yes, sir. You said that uh, officers are trained to be hypervigilant at all times. And that would be true for SWAT trained officers even more so, right? Yes, sir. Even at the bar? Sure, okay. Now, you also described that you were trained to uh, defend against attacks from any deadly weapon. And Mr. Clark made a point of saying a pin can be a deadly weapon. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, in that room, 7-Eleven, you've seen the photographs, you've seen the crime scene video, you've seen the 3D digital scan, and there is not another thing in that room that is a deadly weapon or could be used as such, is there? No. Now, on direct examination, you said that uh, you were taught to terminate a threat. You were trained to use lethal, lethal force until the action is stopped. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you also sat, sat at council table and heard Captain Gonzalez, who you personally know, describe the Santa, Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office's SOP with regard to the use of deadly force. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. And I asked him specifically whether or not shooting somebody in the back is an appropriate use of deadly force. And his answer was no. Isn't that correct? Yes. And you've read that policy, and you didn't follow it that day, did you? I shot the gun and I stopped. Answer the question. You didn't follow it, did you? I shot. I didn't know where answer he was back the question. or whatever. He was going to kill me. He's... failed, didn't you? I failed? Yes, you failed to follow your agency's procedures. You're still a certified peace officer, even though you weren't wearing the badge and in a patrol unit at that time, right? Right. Your current wife, then girlfriend, Ms. Leah Tafoya, you said that uh, you had teamed with the uh, Sheriff's Office SWAT team had teamed with adult probation to serve warrants. She was a probation officer, right? Yes, yeah, she was a probation officer. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let 
say that again. I'll go to it now. She's a probation officer and you were on the phone with her, right? Yes, sir. You, you heard her testify that whenever she heard the shots on the phone, she called Josh Sexauer. Isn't that correct? Yes. She's a member of the Department of Corrections. They have to go through some type of academy as well, don't they? Yes, they do. And they're familiar with uh, warrant service procedures, warrant verification procedures. Yeah, I would say some of them. And uh, it's fair to say that people generally don't hear gunshots over the phone every day, isn't that right? Yeah. And so whenever she hears gunshots over the phone, the first person she calls is Josh Tetzow, not 911. That's strange, isn't it? Well, I think she wanted to um, It's strange, isn't it? I would say it's strange. If you're on the phone with somebody and you hear gunshots, are you going to call your friend or are you going to call somebody who can get some help? You're a cop. You know the answer. Who are you no. going to call? Someone who can help. 911, right? Right. said that your met normal method of maintaining the capacity on your firearm is to load it to maximum capacity, rack the slide, and then there's one in the chamber, 14 in the magazine, correct? Yes. Sir. That, mount, that, uh, that compares favorably to the amount of cartridge casings that were uh, found in the crime scene, which was a total of 10, and the number of rounds which were recovered from your firearm, isn't that right? Yes. There was a lot of drinking going on this day, wasn't it? Yes, there was. You decided to have your friend Josh Sexauer join you and uh, <clears throat> He's your friend, right? Yes, he's my friend. He didn't know Jeremy Martin from Adam, did he? No, he didn't know him before. So when you heard Josh Sexauer say that uh, he thought that Jeremy Martin was sort of like being an ass, uh, it's fair to assume that since he knows you but he doesn't know Jeremy, if there's any difference between the two, he's more than likely going to side with you, right? Yes. You said that you were being obnoxious. Fair enough? That's yeah, fair. Your Honor, at this time, may we approach? Yes, sir.